certain point in the process, you have to give up the directing and get into the the show. So, um, and that can be detrimental to the production. So, but uh, this this one seemed to work, and it was fun to be in it uh, and to to have a certain amount of presence as a as a director or something that person that's hovering on the edges the the, narr the narrative voice the the voice that's containing the whole piece um, the voice is giving it context I thought that was interesting and I think that's what I did as a director is try to give a context try to give the former some context I don't know what they think but that's what I was trying to do all the narration was added <clears throat> And and that's something that Early and I have done from way back at, at the beginning with, with uh, Little Girl Dreams of Taking the Veil. We used, that was based on a Max Ernst collage novel that had an introduction. And, and we used the introduction as the text for the piece. And, um, and then we had, um, there was some narrative voice in um, Certitude and Joy. And, and, and there was a, well, the Burroughs was the main narrator of, of Queer. So this kind of sense of telling a story with the narrative voices, uh, a lot of what seems to always fall into the stuff that he and I do. And I don't know who's, you know, I never remember whose idea it was and it doesn't make any difference, but Erling wrote some stuff to give the piece context. The piece was originally performed in German with some maybe Russian in at the Klagenfurter Ensemble, which is in Austria, I think. And um, that had, they're much more familiar with Harms and Harms' work. The Czechs are very familiar with Harms and Harms. Any, anybody that's brushed up against the Russians seem to be familiar with Harms, but we are, have less of familiarity with his work. So I, we thought it was important for a, you know, a U.S. audience to have a sense of the context, who he was, what happened to him, who, was his, who were his collaborators, and you know, the arc of the backstory, which was you know, the Siege of Leningrad, 1942, Stalin, all of that stuff. But these guys were, I mean, Harms in particular was a... He, was, he did not like the proletariat. He was just a middle-class guy who wanted to have fun doing what he was doing. At least this is my reading of it. And uh, so we wanted to be able to contextualize that for the audience by creating the, the narrative. Yeah. As usual, Erling didn't want to pay too much attention to the casting. So we get down to, we knew that we had Laura. We knew that we had Bob. We didn't have another male singer. We didn't have another female singer. So Laura suggested Nicola, and and we didn't know Nicola, so we kind of based our decision on Laura's enthusiasm about Nicola. And then um, we couldn't find this guy, this the lead character guy, the singer, the big you know. So I said, "Bye." So I said, "Well." How about Duncan? And Duncan is Erling's son, and Duncan was up for the challenge. And um, and I love that. I, I in the last opera, Circuit and Joy, I cast Erling in it. Just at the last moment, moment, because we had a rehearsal and there was no one there, and so Erling had to stand in. And I said, "Okay, well, that's you're it. You're in it now. So get used to it." So, and it was nice to kind of pass that down and kind of get Duncan into it. And Duncan comes from a totally different type of, of uh, theatrical milieu. I mean, he's into sketch comedy and runs this thing called Piano Fight with a bunch of other people, very collaborative. And the youngest member of this ensemble, um, although he may be, maybe Nicola's younger, I don't know. So the, the casting was, uh, happens kind of like this with a, a toss of the hat and the spin of the coin and 
And then we, we live with who we get, and usually instinctually and uh, intuitionally, those are really good choices because I, I like the choice of Duncan. I love the choice of Nicola. Uh, so I'm glad they were all in it. Well, I didn't know Nicola from Schmickle. You know, and she was fantastic, and she had some great ideas, and she and Laura together kind of created the choreography, some of their choreography, and uh, it was Nicola's idea to have Stalin kind of disrobe at a certain point and be slightly different than what we think of Stalin. And it was, it was great. It was a great idea. So they were very strong collaborators. You know, there's something I very strongly feel about the material, and <clears throat> we were rehearsing, and I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I, I don't know anything about Russia, other than, you know, what's in the news, and I didn't know anything about pussy riots, and I heard them in the news, but, <clears throat> so at some point Laura said, oh, well, this section should be an homage to pussy riots, so then, of course, I went online, did the whole, whole Pussy Riot thing. And um, was very moved by that material and very moved by the echo of, of the Oberio group and Daniel Harms and stuff. Because those people were particularly Videns Viv 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 Vidensky or Vivensky or whatever his name is, the Russian poet, was a, a, a real inspiration for Pussy Riot. So there's a lot of crossover in here, and we tried to give a little homage in there to Pussy Riot that kind of crosses over with the death of Kazimir Malevich, and, and um, I was very moved by that material. And by, you know, artists who, who are, are in these kind of oppressive regimes or countries and blah, 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 and are trying to kind of create, uh, a, trying to just do their work. Most of them are apolitical. Uh, um, Harms was apolitical or was not interested in politics. He was in, just interested in the work that he was doing. Um, but these little voices that become over time very big voices um, are, was very moving to me. And when I first got the libretto, I it was all kind of whatever. It was a bunch of stuff. And after working on it, I came to really appreciate the work that the two librettists did. I, I really think they did a fantastic job with the libretto. Of course, Erling did a lot of, did the translation from German into English, but they did a great job, and I, I, I would really like to meet them. Vada. The difficult thing was rehearsing because we, I had everyone for two rehearsals. So, and we had, we were constantly changing venues. We had a very short rehearsal process and it was extremely stressful. And, you know, early and I talked about, well, should we do it now or should we do it later? And he wanted to do it now. And I looked at my schedule and I said, well, you know, I have about 15 free days. But to try to schedule everybody else was, was difficult. So that was, that was, the most difficult thing. Everybody's a very competent performer, so um, they they did beautifully. But it was it was like you know I was banging my head up against the wall trying to figure out how how this was going to work. And it was interesting too because he started rehearsing the band first and recording the band first. The process is usually different. The the actors the singers get together first and then the band comes in at the very end. But this was this was reversed for, for recording purposes, and I thought that was interesting. The band was fabulous. Stuff I've worked with Jim for I'm just trying to figure out 35, maybe 40 years. Uh, with Jim, who always too is addicted to original stuff, and Erling, I became his alter ego during 10 days. So this is the 10 days certitude and joy. Uh, oops, this, this is the third thing I've worked with Erling. Our backgrounds are both in the Lutheran Church. His dad was a Lutheran preacher. Uh, mine was uh, fundamentalist Lutheran Church in the country, and they tried to talk me into that fundamentalism. That I got the bail on that at about five years of age. And the theater has been, uh, you know, original stuff. Uh, uh, 
the Iowa Theater Lab premiere American Gutowski group at the University of Iowa, and then Lake Street Hawkeyes borrowed the Hawkeyes name, and uh, we had a collective. A phys it was pri physically driven, but also writers and stuff. And it was a total collective, and that was in Berkeley, and uh, it's just great. I mean, there's, or like Erling and Jim, it's like you know, it's sort of not you don't question anything. It's just to go along and. Uh, and when people come into a rehearsal who don't know that we know each other and how we know each other, it can seem kind of brutal and uh, mean, uh, but it's really not. There's just a code about, well, just stop doing that and do that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, don't be a dipshit and stuff like that. And, but it's, it's totally understandable. It's uh, like a very long-term relationship. And Erling actually relatives fairly recently, but he and Jim have done stuff for a long time, and it was sort of an instant connection with Erling in the beginning. And, uh, um, since the Blake Street Hawkeyes days, since the late 70s, he came in and he and Jack Carpenter were a lighting uh, team, and they came in and sort of lit and did all our stuff for years, really on the cheap, on the fly, in a theater about, like he says, one. ours was 1,400 square feet, the back part of a warehouse in Berkeley. And Jim was working with, uh, he and Jack were a lighting team and then directing stuff. And Jim's the, I do a lot of solo work and uh, Jim's the only guy that's ever uh, directed any of my stuff. Most of it, the solo work was self-motivated, but uh, uh, when I turned it over to Jim, he does something else with it and turns it into uh, really something else, uh, which is great. Always, I think, as much as I hate to say it, better than I can. Wow. Um, discovering that it could happen, <laughs> that you could do all of this work and that you could understand traditional musical process and that you could learn to read a score four times better than you ever could before and that you could understand a conductor and that you could, uh, I mean the learning curve was huge. Uh, the pleasure has been in running it and working with uh, all of these people. I've known Roham a long time. Uh, Wonderful. I've worked with Laura on Certitude and Joy was the first time. I mean, her, Laura and Nicola are just, well, it goes without saying, they're just incredible. Uh, obviously, they're another generation, and there's hope for that because they uh, just powerhouse voices and totally classically musically trained, and then they've got all that physicality. And, uh, and it's great. It's, a, it's irreverent in a very reverent way. I think it's irreverent in a very reverent way. It's may not seem like church, but it is church, actually. So I play Pushkin in the show. Pushkin, who is a famous Russian poet, and also kind of a stand-in for Daniel Harms, who this piece is based on, who was another Russian poet later. I think uh, Pushkin was 19th century. And um, I've not been in an opera before, my first time. And uh, it was great, it was great. In some ways, uh, I feel like, um, not that I still haven't been in one, I definitely have been in one, but um, you know, I do my best to kind of, I feel like I'm moonlighting kind of as, a, as an opera singer, or moonlighting as a, a real character in the opera element. I, you know, I have a lot of acting experience, so I feel like more of an actor, I guess. And yeah, I sing, uh, I sing a bit, I've sang for, for years, so I have a little bit. And then uh, uh, Brian, the uh, conductor, was very helpful, helping me with my voice in this show. And both the singers, Laura and Nicola, were very helpful in helping me with kind of developing my voice for this show. And I, I absolutely improved. Just in the you know month and a half or so that we were rehearsing this show, I got much, much better. I could sing higher, I could sing louder, just from working with them. So thank, go thank them. It's definitely very absurd. <laughs> and, um, you know, I come from a, a background where I've done a bit of theater, but I do a lot of comedy, a lot of sketch comedy, I do a lot of scripted comedy. And I do a lot of, uh, sort of the group that I work with, we, we have a bend towards doing meta narratives and things like that, and sometimes breaking the fourth wall. And, so I, I leaned on some of those, hopefully, strengths that I have, and I tried to bring a little bit of comedy to the character into the show, and the show being very absurd. You know, I've watched plenty of my dad's shows. It's the first time I've been in one. But obviously, sometimes 
it gets very strange and it, you know you might even feel a little lost and so I let the character it was kind of lucky that I got to play this character who was a writer and who um it had, <laughs> I was lucky that I got to play this character who was a writer and sort of writing the show and thinking of the show in a way because it let me watch it and it let me try to relate to the audience in a way if anything I tried to bring like a little bit of a rela uh, relatability to the character for the audience so sometimes there were lines where I would say something like, mm, so what, what were we talking about? You know, and I try to play those, like play those to the audience and let them, let them connect a little bit and feel like uh, I was kind of on their side. In, in a lot of ways, I, I mean, I really felt like in a practical sense, I was working with Jim, the director, Jim Cave. I mean, Erling was always there, Erling was playing music, and we would talk, and he would have suggestions and, and such sometimes, and I met with him a few times to work on music, but that was much more like a nuts and bolts that was like, you know, it was very practical. Was like, what is the note? What is the rhythm? It wasn't, it, it, I actually felt like, it was more, it was more like working with Erling's material than it was working with Erling. I was working with Erling's material and the, the librettist's material and then working with Jim. But all of that was great. I mean, the music is really nice. It was really nice. The, uh, the, the script is very absurd, but it's very nice. And Jim is a wonderful director to work with. I love working with Jim. First, there's one other person who would know this, but uh, Laura and I had a lot of fun in that bedroom scene. And then every time we would like duck down, especially after I, like, I sang the first part and we would be behind the, um, the curtain together, there would always be this moment of like, nice job or like ooh, I missed that last line and like we would always kind of share that <laughs> that quick sort of check-in on how we were doing uh, before we would go on and finish that scene mm -hmm. uh, Bob Bob is like cannot be anything but hilarious like he could try to not be funny and he would fail he's the, just hilarious he just is <laughs> I, I love working with him. Um, I was a classical pianist for my whole childhood, and um, in high school I started singing jazz and blues, and then um, I went to a summer program, and the teacher there told me, the voice teacher told me, you're an opera singer. I'm like, no, gross. And it actually, she's right. Turned out she was right. So I went to the conservatory music, and that was two years ago I graduated, and here I am. Speed and opera singer. So. Yeah, we all have different styles of performing, I think. Nicola and I are more similar, and Duncan is more really straight man in a way. Mm -hmm. But I think it works, because he's just communicating to a different part of the audience, or a different part of you. You relate to him more as a... Um, like a sketch comic, because that's what he is. So he brought that level of conversation to the piece. And Bob brought like this kind of, you know, gravitas, because he's also like a clown. And Roham, yeah. Roham, come here Roham. In many collaboration, I remember Erling's work, uh, the little girl taking the whale, well from the trilogy of Max Ernst, the great, 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 great surrealist. Uh, I was house manager there. And also I work with Erling during Carla Harriman's uh, piece and many, many other occasions. I just love Erling and his work because it allows me as an actor to explore <laughs> spaces. Uh, like in this uh, specific piece, not only every phrase informed my mm, uh, future or, or the next movement, but also created ambient for me to undertake different mood and rhythm as an actor and relate to my fellow beautiful actress and singer Aww. on stage. We had three moments together with the Marina. Hi for Pushkin. That's right. But I'm Marina, I'm bringing the, the bag of uh, food for Pushkin, and he's like a guard. I'm a guard. I'm a guard who is, uh, who is very much against uh, Marina's decadent uh, petty bourgeois oh, that uh, thing uh, in, in the technicality of the uh, intelligent uh, service of the Soviet, but inside I have great admiration. 
and uh, it's all the unspoken invisible feelings that I have for the woman that I have to constrain. Wow, I didn't know this was happening. It's very perverse. Yeah. Talk. Yes, but you see it in his face. That's why he's a good actor. <laughs> you see all that happening. Unfortunately, I don't think the audience can really see your face. You cannot see my face. True. Because... Uh, he's always in shadow. I'm always in shadow. I have a big mustache, which I just shaved. But you're very physical performer. I'm, I'm a very physical performer. Uh, especially when it comes to experimental, avant-garde theater, which I adore. I adore. I do. Otherwise, hey, give me a Shakespeare and I will learn the line and I will screw it up for you at any given moment. Since I'm not actually in this production, sometimes I am, since I'm just standing off to the side, then I get to actually experience it. And tonight, I really noticed, I mean, yesterday too, a little bit, that they really um, found this universe, this space, and uh, I felt like I was in it with them. I mean, I hope the audience felt that way too. Um, it takes a little while to get there, but when you get there, then you just feel like you're in a different place. I mean, theater is kind of amazing that way. I mean, movies, I guess, too, but you know, there's just theater is immersive, you're there. And, um, and it's kind of amazing, in fact, that you can, even though you're there in this room and it's obviously artificial, and you know, there's props and there's people right there and you're sitting in a crowd that you can lose that and really be in this other space, that you can believe that, that you're there in this world. And tonight I really noticed it and I really noticed that I didn't want it to end. I wanted it to just keep going. I just wanted to stay there with them. So um, that's probably my overall most uplifting aspect of what, what happened. There are certain moments, it's funny, sometimes not even your favorite moments that you write, uh, you know, you think, oh, this is the best, oh, this is a great piece of music, I love this moment. But then it isn't necessarily those, because performers, of course, are huge. You know, they, they make it into something. And um, so sometimes things you didn't even think were that good, the performer does it and you go, oh, you know, I get it now. It's really, it's kind of funny. So there are definitely those. You know, there's, there's moments that Laura sings, moments that Nicholas sings, acting things that Duncan or Bob do that just are just perfect. I and I, I love those when those happen. Unexpected things. I really liked working with people that cried across between these worlds of classical music and jazz. They have a very different take than just a classical ensemble. Even playing kind of straight music, um, they will, they have a very different feel. And in fact, they will tend to kind of imbue the music with a certain feel uh, in the sense that you'd use that in jazz, like a, a groove or a feel, more than in classical music, which tends to be more, which tends to be more about playing the notes as they are on the page, very straight. Um, the other thing is I, I knew there'd be these improvised sections. So I wanted people that were comfortable doing some improvisation while uh, you know, there's narration that I had, and uh, those sections are, they, they take off from things that I've written, and they kind of wander away, and those, that's, that's them. They're, they're wandering away, they wander away, and then they come back into my stuff. So, you know, not all classical musicians are so comfortable with that, especially in the old days. Nowadays, you get people who have grown up listening to a lot of different things, and they tend to have, be a little more comfortable. Yeah, anyway, blathering. This theater in Austria, in southern Austria, in Klagenfurt, who had done a piece of mine a long time ago, uh, A Little Girl Dreams of Taking the Veil. They did a German version of it. I translated it into German for them, and they toured it a bit. Um, they had been talking to me for years about doing another piece, and they wanted to do something using these texts by this author, Daniel Karms. Arms. And uh, so the libretto was written in German originally by these two people. It's discussed actually in the in the piece. Um, uh, this couple, and one of them is Russian, one of them is Austrian, 
So she, the, the woman who's Russian had grown up with Karm's, um, his children's books, because that's what he was known for. Um, his adult works, when he was basically killed, you know, his adult works were suppressed. His, his friends, like some friends of his, actually went over to his apartment, gra grabbed his stuff and like hid it away and it didn't appear for decades. Um, and uh, so they, <clears throat> they were very much into this guy and they, they wrote this libretto, which, you know, at the, when I first saw it, it just seemed like a big jumble of stuff. I mean, it's all these little stories of his just kind of arranged about. And um, I would say, and it was in German, you know, and so I, there's, all, there's this barrier. I mean, I, like I said, I can kind of figure out the German and I, I know how to set German, I know how to speak German, so I know how to sing German. But um, I wouldn't say that I got it as deeply as I could have. If it had been English, it would have been a lot simpler. Um, but then kind of going through that process of writing it, which is kind of funny that to not really understand it, but to write it. And then um, to see it performed there and then to get something from that. And then I go through this process of translating that into English. And I went, I went both from the German to English and also found the original Russian texts and, and took them into English and also had some translations that other people had done. Um, I learned a lot more about what the texts were. <laughs> um, and we kept their, the same structure. Actually, the structure is good. They, there's a lot of things that lead into other things, even though they're, they're, you could say it's a lot of disjointed texts, there are connections between them. Um, and then I decided for the English version, because Carms isn't as known here as he is in Europe, that I should add this narration. So I wrote the narration, which is what Jim does in the piece. Um, that sets the context, that tells a little more about the history for people who are not as familiar with it. And it's in my usual kind of bloviating style where it's, you know, it's a little bit over the top. Um, and Jim is really good at that. He's really good at presenting that kind of material where it's already kind of too big and then he makes it even bigger. There are musical, there are musical themes and connect, musical connections in the piece that just naturally happen. They're not necessarily planned out. Sometimes they are. Sometimes they say, I need to bring this music back because it's a unifying element and I want to bring it back here. There's, for example, in this piece, there's four boxes, as they call them, essentially like little scenes or acts, mini acts. Um, and in between, so the, in between those four boxes, there are these three uh, interact uh, moments. And they're all the same, they're all very similar music. The music comes back and is developed. So that gives it a certain kind of structure. So things like that, you know, I do think about that. I say, oh, that'll give it this really clear structure. That at the end of each act, there's, a, there's this music that happens. It's the buff bub scenes, these kind of comical scenes in the cafe. Um, but then, you know, when you're in, when you're writing a big piece like this, you know, it's an hour and something, hour and a half, um, you just put yourself in a certain space, especially if you're writing it fast, like I did. This piece was written pretty fast, for me, even, a couple months. You just get into a mental space where what you write is connected, all connected in some way, and you're not even thinking about it. Music analysts tend to go back and find those things and make a big deal of them. But this isn't, it isn't like a pre-compositional decision where you're plotting this stuff out. It just happens because you, you're in this mental space where these are the chords, these are the kind of ways that you're approaching the music. That's what happens. Mm -hmm.